So I think we have a uh, good number of people online now, so we'll get started. It's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Kathy Mazzola, who I think doesn't need much of an introduction to us. She's well known to, I think, almost all of us. Uh, Kathy did her undergraduate work at the College of Mount St. Vincent. She went on to get her MD degree at UMDNJ New Jersey Medical School. She stayed on at UMDNJ for her neurosurgery residency and then did a pediatric neurosurgery fellowship at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Kathy has had interest in craniofacial malformations, spasticity and gait disorders in children, as well as pediatric brain tumors. And she's really been instrumental in setting up and running uh, multidisciplinary clinics in all of these areas. She's also been extremely active on local hospital committees as well as state and national committees. She's also been very active in medical student and resident education and also very active in clinical research and has multiple publications in peer-reviewed journals. Today, Kathy's going to speak to us on atlantoaxial subluxation in the pediatric population. Thank you, John. So um, thank you for uh, logging in and watching this with me. I thought it would be an interesting topic because last year we had approximately four or five patients who came in to Morristown with atlantoaxial subluxation, and sometimes those patients are a little bit confusing and difficult to manage. So I have no disclosures. <clears throat> so today we're going to describe atlantoaxial subluxation, or Cock-Robin syndrome as it's called. We'll discuss some of the imaging options for these children and go over some of the treatment options for these kids who have atlantoaxial subluxation. And we'll talk about what are the indications for open reduction and C1, C2 fusion in children with uh, recurrent or recalcitrant atlantoaxial subluxation. So just to review really quickly, um, the nervous system and the spine actually start developing um, uh, soon after the embryo is formed. We have seven cervical vertebrae. C1 at the top is known as the atlas. C2 is known as the axis. Uh, the cervical medullary junction of the spinal cord is right around this area. And then the subaxial spine is C3, four, five, C6, and C7. The bones fit together like pieces of a puzzle, but they're also held together by ligaments into proper alignment. If you look at C1, C1 sits right below the base of the skull, and part of the base of the skull called the occipital bone, the occipital condyles sit in a cup right here, number six, formed by the superior articular facet on the lateral mass of C1. So this is the front of C1, known as the anterior arch. This back here is the posterior arch. And in approximately 5% of children, this arch may be open. These are the lateral sides of C1. And you can see a hole here and a hole here. This is called the Freeman transversarium, and basically the vertebral artery goes through there. C2, oh, C2, which is the uh, axis, uh, you can see in the diagram that the front of, um, let me see if I have this. All right, oh, not that one. Maybe this button, yeah. So the front of uh, C2 is called the dens over here. And again, you can see the superior articular facet, which is on the lateral aspect of C2. The Freeman transversarium is where the vertebral artery passes. And then you can see the posterior arch of C2 and the spinous process of C2. So if you look at the two vertebrae, C1 and C2 together, C1 fits right over the top of C2, and the dens uh, 
actually sits right behind the articular facet, right over there. So they sort of lock together. And when they lock together, they're held in place by ligaments. So you can see here, this is a lower part of the spine. You have the anterior longitudinal ligament, the posterior longitudinal ligament, and then you have ligaments po more posteriorly, and you even have ligaments over the joint capsules in the spine. So the spine does have joints, and it allows us to move. If you look at C1, C2 specifically, you have the alar ligament, which goes across here, the transverse ligament, and then the cruciate lig ligament, and that helps to hold the dens in position right behind C1, and I'll show you sort of what that looks like. So again, this is C2, this is C1, and you can see how the dens fits up against C1 right there, and it allows you to rotate. So a significant part of your ability to turn your head comes from the rotatory or the rotatory component of C1 and C2. So you can see when C, C1 turns over C2, the vertebral artery, which goes through those little holes on the side of the vertebrae, has to be a little oh bit mobile, but you can see how C1 turns over C2. It's always important to remember that not just the blood vessels, but the spinal cord and the nerves okay. go through. Uh -huh. And so that if you have a fracture or a cervical spine injury, you have to watch that child for any kind of neurological problems because you can have a vertebral artery injury, such as a dissection or a thrombosis, which could cause a stroke. So it's very important if you see a child with a cervical spine injury to speak with uh, neurosurgery and to follow that child really carefully for any signs of stroke. This is a CT angiogram reconstructed into a 3D picture. And again, you can see C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7. You can see the second segment of the vertebral artery coming up through uh, the foramen, and then the third part of the vertebral artery looping around the C2 and C1 complex up here. So you can see how that artery has to turn with C1 and C2 if a child rotates their head. So there are a lot of differences between pediatric and adult cervical spine that make children uh, uh, more prone to atlantoaxial subluxation. Their bones are softer and not completely calcified yet. Their ligaments and their muscles are much weaker and underdeveloped. The ring of C1, as we talked about, may be open posteriorly. Children have a bigger head to neck or head to torso ratio is compared to adults. And the joints that we talked about and we just looked at, those joints are often more horizontal. And all of these factors together make children at higher risk of a C1, C2 subluxation. So what do these kids look like when they come in to your offices? Kids with C1, C2 subluxation have a head position that's known as the cock Robin syndrome. These kids all come in with their head tilted to one side and their chin turned to the opposite side. They kind of look like a little, a little bird with their head turned. There you go. There it is. You'll never forget that now. When you do x-rays, this is kind of what they look like. The skull x-ray shows that the head's tilted or <coughs> But if you notice, when you look at that cervical spine x-ray, what you really don't see well is the cervical spine. So unfortunately, many children who are sent for cervical spine x-rays, this is what they look like, and you can't see the upper part of the cervical spine at all. So in a C1, C2 subluxation, C1 rotates or turns over C2 and gets stuck 
in that position. So the joint may be a little bit loose because it's flatter and the ligaments are weak. C1 turns over C2 and then it can't go back into a normal position. So these kids will come in with their head tilted and turned and they cannot voluntarily move their head back into normal position. And I wouldn't recommend forcing their head into normal position. Um, you can have a grade one, a grade two, or a grade three uh, rotatory subluxation, depending on how many degrees C1 is rotated over C2. And obviously a grade three is a more serious subluxation. C1, C2 subluxation can happen from trauma, and it doesn't have to be a severe trauma. It could be something where the child was reaching for something and turned their head the wrong way. Uh, however, C1, C2 subluxation happens very often in children with infection, and then it's called Grisel syndrome. They may have a retropharyngeal infection going on, like a strep throat or an abscess or tonsillitis. And what happens is that the inflammation at the back of the throat further softens the ligaments and makes that child more prone to subluxation. Once you have ligamentous laxity or floppy ligaments, it allows C1 to rotate over C2 in an abnormal way. We see this very often in children with Down syndrome, and we've had a few kids in the pediatric ICU here in a halo vest uh, from C1, C2 subluxation and Down syndrome. You can see it after oral maxillofacial surgery where the head may have been turned in a certain position for surgery for a very long time. You can see this after dental procedures. It's common in achondroplasia because of their bone anatomy. And we've seen children who've had a combination of several of the above factors. So how do you diagnose C1, C2 subluxation? 90% of the diagnosis is on clinical examination. So the minute I walk into the patient's exam room and I see the child stuck with their head tilted and turned, I know what they have, but I usually will send them to the pediatric emergency room for cervical spine x-rays. It's really important to talk to the radiologist and tell them what you suspect and what you want to see because normally if they send a child for cervical spine x-rays, they'll just do an anterior posterior x-ray or a lateral x-ray. They will not do an open mouth x-ray. If you suspect C1, C2 subluxation, you really have to try to get an open mouth x-ray uh, or you're not gonna be able to see what you need to see. You can send the child for a CAT scan, but then there is a significant um, higher uh, radiation exposure. If you do a CT scan, you really need to look at C1, C2 in coronal, sagittal, and axial views. It's very helpful to ask the radiologist to do a three-dimensional or reconstructed view. An MRI is not a great uh, scan for a C1, C2 subluxation. It will show you the spinal cord and may show you if there's inflammation at the back of the throat, and may show you some enhancement of the ligaments if there is active infection and uh, inflammation, but it is not a great scan for bone anatomy. So on clinical exam, which is 90% of the diagnosis, the child comes in with their head tilted and their chin turned to the opposite side. The child will often complain of neck pain and muscle spasm, and they'll tell you they're not able to rotate their head or their neck, and that's because they have the LOC C1, C2 subluxation. On cervical spine x-rays in an adult, you can see C1 very nicely, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7, very nice. You can look at the alignment, but in a child, this is what you get. You can't really see their cervical spine very well because they have a bigger head, and that sometimes can obscure the cervical spine on cervical spine x-rays. And again, when you look at the anterior posterior view, very often right up here where C1, C2 is, you don't get to see C1, C2 on an anterior posterior x-ray, and their mandible is blocking the view for C1, C2. So you actually need to ask for an open mouth view. 
Now this is probably the best open mouth view I've ever seen because it's in a textbook. We never get this quality of open mouth x-rays from kids. They don't cooperate that well. So if you ask a child to open their mouth and keep it open and shoot an x-ray through their mouth, theoretically this is what you should see, where you can see C1 on the right, C1 um, or over here, lateral mass on the left, and then you can see the dens or the odontoid process of C2 nicely located right in the middle. But again, we really don't get to see these x-rays in kids. This is what we get when we ask a kid to do an open mouth view. And as you see, you really can't see much of anything. So lateral view, open mouth view, it doesn't look that great. This is a CT scan here. So this is the coronal view on a CT scan. And you can see the dens here is located closer to the lateral mass of C1 here on the right. And then this is a sagittal view. Sagittal views are not super helpful. But on the axial view, again, you can see the dens of C2 is not symmetrically placed between the lateral masses of C1. So if you look at the axial and you look at the coronal, that will give you a clue that something's going on. Again, if you look at the MRI for a child who has subluxation, you can see the spinal cord here with spinal fluid in, in front and behind the spinal cord. This is C2. You might see some signal changes up here from inflammation you know, of the ligaments up there, but you really don't get to see bone anatomy as well as you do on a CT scan. Here you can see a little fracture of the tip of the dens right there. So, but on a three-dimensional CT view of cervical subluxation, here you can really see how C1 is rotated and anterior displaced over C2. So this is a much better view of a C1, C2 rotatory subluxation, but you can see that it has about, you know, several times the amount of radiation as a cervical spine x-ray. MRI has no radiation, but usually requires sedation. And again, it doesn't show you the bone anatomy. So you're almost, you know, committing the child to getting a 3D CT scan. So it's important to speak to the radiologist, tell them what you suspect, and see if you can limit the amount of radiation dose and perhaps do a CT scan from the occiput, which is the bottom of the skull, through C4 to just cut down a little bit on the radiation that the child is receiving. And then if you get a 3D CT scan for diagnostic purposes while you're treating the child, I would only recommend following with cervical spine x-rays. And then once you've got the patient into a neutral position, a, a cervical spine x-ray is nice. You don't need to get a 3D CT scan, but sometimes it, it does help to show resolution of that. So once you've diagnosed a C1, C2 subluxation, how do you treat the child? And really, every child is different, and there are no great guidelines that have been published in neurosurgery or orthopedic literature. So there are many different considerations. You have to talk, look at the age of the child, how thick the skull is, what do the bones of the cervical spine look like. You have to think about how long the child has been subluxed, because I'll, I'll show you two little cases at the end. One was an acute subluxation that happened two weeks ago, and one was a subluxation that had been present for approximately eight years. You have to look at the cause of subluxation of C1 and C2. You have to talk to the family and find out what are their attitudes and expectations about treatment. You have to look at the child's activity level. Um, if a child has Down syndrome, they may not keep the hard cervical collar on and they may constantly take it off. So you might have to do a different kind of uh, management. Uh, you have to look and see, is this child very athletic and um, wants to be 
um, out there doing sports. Uh, you have to look, consider the future impact on cervical spine mechanics because once you do a fusion, whether it's a two-level fusion or a three-level fusion, you do create a lot of uh, mechanical stress at the level above the fusion and the level below the fusion. So it's something that we always think about and consider. We usually send these children to the emergency room uh, just at least for diagnostic purposes and then we'll sometimes start children on muscle relaxants, the oral muscle relaxants that we've used are oral baclofen or oral Valium. And if the child doesn't take the medication or refuses to take the medication, you can do IV Valium or other muscle relaxants. You try to control for pain with Tylenol, Motrin, or Advil. Uh, if it's a mild subluxation, you can try kinesio taping. This is usually done by a physical therapist where the head is gently pulled to the other side and then taped. So when the child wants to go back into the head tilt, the tape pulls them the other way. You can put the child in a hard cervical collar, and I'll show you some examples of the two collars I, I like to use. You can do halo traction, uh, halo vest immobilization, or a C1 and C2, or occipital cervical fusion, and I'll show you those different things. So this is a soft collar, and we usually will try to put a child in a soft collar in the office if possible. Um, and we use this once the child has been immobilized for a long time in a hard collar. So when we send children home with a hard collar, think about how that mother or father is going to take care of the child at home. This is called a Miami J hard collar, and it has a soft material cushion under the hard plastic, and it has to fit snugly under the chin. We've come in to seeing hard collars that have been put on patients, and the chin rest is up around the nose, that doesn't work. It also doesn't work if the chin rest is way below the chin because then the child can rotate and move. It really is supposed to be an immobilizing collar. It has to be tight, it has to be snug, otherwise you're not putting it on properly. So this is a Miami J. If you send this home, how is the mom supposed to bathe the child? So we do teach the mother and father how to take on and put off a Miami J collar. <clears throat> and we always give them a, a Philadelphia collar, which has, <clears throat> excuse me, no material on it and can go into the shower. So I say, tell them they can use this for the shower and this for the rest of the time. And those are hard collars. <clears throat> so when we see children in the emergency room, putting them in a collar while they're still subluxed is not going to work. In <clears throat> neurosurgical residency program, we're taught how to do a manual reduction. I wouldn't recommend doing this in your office. It should always be done in a hospital setting. And there are certain things you should do in order to monitor the patient while you're doing a manual reduction. If you don't want to do a manual reduction, you can always try chin strap traction. However, most children will not tolerate this unless they're being sedated. And if you over sedate the child and you lose your neurological exam, you should not be putting them in traction. There are different kinds of halo traction. This part is called the halo because it goes around the head like a halo. And you can see there are several screws that get screwed in to the child's skull. This is done in the operating room for children. For adults, we put adult patients into a halo ring, into traction, and into halo vests on the patient's floor using lidocaine to numb the skin right underneath the pin. However, for children, I will not do this on the floor or in the ICU. They have to go to the operating room. For adults, we usually put four pins in the halo. For kids, we usually put six to eight pins in the halo. <clears throat> Once they're in a halo, they can go into halo traction. So you have the halo bale, and you have a rope, which goes to a pulley, 
and then weights on the end of the bed. And the weights are constantly pulling the head up and pulling the cervical spine into a neutral position. For children with spinal deformity, you can actually have them in active halo traction where the child's allowed to be in a wheelchair or even standing while they're in traction. And we usually only do that for children with severe scoliosis or kyphotic deformity to see what kind of straightening or correction we can get before a spinal fusion. There's always surgery. So you can always do a C1, C2 fusion, which uh, is done obviously in the operating room from a posterior approach where you put screws through C1 and C2 and you can supplement the fusion with wires and bone from the child. You can do different kinds of constructs and these hold C1 and C2 in a neutral position. However, like I mentioned before, it does put stress at the occipital cervical level and does put stress at the joint levels below the fusion. In severe cases or in children with uh, poor bone quality, like children with neurofibromatosis or Down syndrome, they might, might require an extended fusion, which would go from the back of the skull, the occipital bone, down through C1 and C2. So once you incorporate the occipital bone, it's called an occipital cervical fusion, and this is what it actually looks like. There are screws and plates placed on the occipital bone, and then screws in C1, C2, and sometimes even C3 with uh, permanent rods, titanium rods, uh, which hold the bones in place. So acute, subacute, and chronic atlantoaxial subluxation. Acute subluxation is easier to correct with a C1, C2 reduction, whether it's a manual reduction or traction to reduce, and then putting that child in a collar with some muscle relaxants usually will take care of the problem. But in chronic subluxation, there can actually be bone and joint remodeling, and therefore it's more difficult to treat. Because once that bone changes shape, it's obviously will have a tendency to go back into that sublux position. So even if you achieve reduction, recurrent C1, C2 subluxation is risk is higher in children with chronic subluxation. It's higher in children with Down syndrome or other disorders where they have lax ligaments. So those children may need prolonged immobilization and careful follow-up, and intraoperative fusion may be unavoidable in some children. However, um, <clears throat> this year we've had three children uh, with C1, C2 subluxation in the fall of 2019 and none of them required intraoperative uh, fusion. However, one of the children had some recurrent C1, C2 subluxation, and we'll talk about that at the case presentation. So now, I didn't want to scare any of the pediatricians. When you see torticollis in a baby, this is not C1, C2 subluxation. So uh, torticollis in an infant is very common. It can occur secondary to intrauterine positioning or some postnatal weakness. Um, it, sometimes you see some weakness of this, the arm as well. Um, it could be from a brachial plexus injury. Physical therapy is what we recommend for all these children. The sooner you start it, the better. We also recommend two hours of tummy time when the baby is awake. As soon as the baby falls asleep, put the baby back on its back. Do not let the baby sleep on the tummy. Um, if you have torticollis as an infant, it can cause plagiocephaly. Some people think plagiocephaly causes a torticollis. It's like sort of the chicken and the egg kind of question. Um, again, physical therapy is the best thing. However, if you've done physical therapy for a year, you might want to get a CT of the cervical spine to find out why the torticollis is not improving. 
Uh, cervical spine flexion extension x-rays can be done in older children. Uh, you can certainly think about doing a cervical spine MRI to rule out compression if the child has any neurological problems. And then you would obviously only do a surgical fusion if the child is unstable. Um, <clears throat> when you do a decompression for uh, spinal stenosis, especially in children with vertebral anomalies, you really want to decompress conservatively to avoid adding to the instability of the cervical spine. So very often, babies are sent to the office with x-rays of the cervical spine because the torticollis is not getting better. And this is what an infant cervical spine x-ray looks like. So it's kind of... Uh, useless because you can see this is the anterior part, this is the anterior posterior x ray, and the mandible is completely blocking your anterior view of the cervical spine. If you look at the lateral x ray of the cervical spine, again, you can't see much because the bones are not really well developed and they're under mineralized. And so, doing cervical spine x rays in an infant, it's pretty useless. However, if you have a two-year-old and they still have torticollis and the parents have been doing physical therapy religiously and the physical therapist tells you that, you know, the baby seems to have a good range of motion but still goes back into that tilted position, then you might want to think about doing a CT scan because you don't want to miss a hemivertebrae. See that right there? So that's a hemivertebrae in a child who has torticollis. And that will not get better with physical therapy. Physical therapy will not hurt that child, but the child's tilt in torticollis will not get better with just physical therapy. That is a pediatric neurosurgical and pediatric orthopedic surgical case. The same here. This is a child who I saw who uh, was actually uh, discussed and presented by uh, Dr. Lowenstein last night. This is a child who came to see us after, I think she was seven or eight years old. She had torticollis, and we followed her for a while, and eventually her parents, and she decided to go ahead with surgery. So I think she was 12 when we finally operated on her, and because of her significant head tilt and torticollis, we did a uh, cervical spine fusion. But so what happened here? This is developmental. This should be the arch of C1, but it's fused to the base of the skull. So this is an occipital atlanto assimilation where C1 fuses to the bottom of the skull. This is C2, which has an abnormal shape. This is a left hemivertebra between C2 and C3, and because you have a hemivertebra there, it throws off the alignment of the spine below that. So if you don't treat or fix this child's cervical spine anomaly, eventually the child will go on to develop a more compensatory curve below it and develop scoliosis. So there are many different ways to treat hemivertebrae. You can actually, if, if it is free and there's nothing going through it or close to it, you can sometimes remove it and graft and fuse, but this is way beyond this discussion. In <clears throat> any cervical spine trauma, if it's an acute uh, subluxation from a car accident or a bicycle accident, you want to start out with x-rays to rule out a cervical spine fracture. The CT scan is way more sensitive and should be done uh, if the mechanism of injury uh, indicates high risk for fracture. If the child's awake and cooperative and it's an older child, you can always ask the child to do an open mouth x-ray and to do flexion extension x-rays. Um, and you should really look at the x-rays yourself because many of the children that had um, chronic subluxation what we've seen in almost 100% of those cases, the pediatricians did the right thing. They sent the child for cervical spine x-rays, but the x-rays were read as normal when you really, there was no way to see C1 or C2 on those x-rays. So looking back, they were not normal. <clears throat> 
Um, in a child who comes in comatose after a car accident, MRI is very important and very sensitive to look at ligamentous injury and to see if there is uh, any kind of stroke. And you can always do a CT angiogram or MR angiogram if uh, the child's having signs or symptoms of stroke, like a hemiparesis or something like that. If you can't do an MRI right away, leave the child in a hard collar. Do not take the collar off. So I'll run through uh, the first case. This, this is a child who I was talking about who had uh, chronic C1, C2 subluxation. So when she was an infant, she had torticollis, which we felt, or her pediatrician felt, was secondary to an ear infection that was treated with physical therapy. However, by two years of age, it had not really resolved. An MRI was ordered and read as normal. The physical therapist recommended a top collar, which was worn for approximately another two, three years, and they thought her torticollis got a little bit better. When she was six years old, she had a tonsillectomy and developed torticollis uh, again after that. So I saw her when she was approximately eight or nine years old, and she had a head tilt to one side. Her chin was turned to the other side. And uh, she came with a diagnosis of Grisel syndrome. But in all of her school pictures, look at the school pictures, because in every picture, you'll see her head is turned and tilted to the same way. Just ask the mom to bring in her school pictures. So when she was 9 or 10 years old, that's when we finally saw her. We did a, a CT scan with 3D reconstruction, which clearly showed a C1, C2 subluxation with bone remodeling. She was placed into a halo vest in the OR. And then this past November, we had her in halo traction up in the pediatric ICU. We got her nicely reduced in perfectly neutral position. We put her into the halo vest. She wore a halo vest for two months a hard cervical collar for two months, a soft cervical collar for two months. As soon as we took the hard collar off, she did not like wearing the soft collar. And after physical therapy, she went back into the head tilt position. So I've met with her parents right now. We're doing some kinesio taping and some physical therapy. Her torticollis is not as bad as it was before, but it's still there, and they really do not want surgery at this point in time. This is a different kind of case, though. So this is a seven-year-old girl who was sent to me by an orthopedic surgeon. She, uh, she was jumping on a bed, fell off the bed, hit her head, and uh, hurt her shoulder. Her pediatrician referred her to an orthopedic surgeon who ordered cervical spine x-rays. This was the x-ray that was done and read as normal. So this is not a normal cervical spine x-ray. You can't read this as normal because you can't see C1 and C2. And obviously, her head is not straight. So this is not a normal cervical spine x-ray. So she was referred to pediatric neurosurgery. Uh, I sent her uh, to the uh, emergency room. Eventually, she had a 3D CT scan done. And in the 3D CT scan, you can see C1 subluxed over C2 there. An MRI of the, uh, the uh, spinal, uh, cervical spine was unremarkable. She was started on muscle relaxants and manually reduced. Once um, I got her reduced, we put her in a hard collar. However, she kept taking off the hard collar and wiggling out of it. So after three attempts with reducing her and putting her in a hard collar, uh, I finally said that's it. She had to go into uh, traction. So this, I think, was in December of this year. She was put into a halo in the OR. She uh, was in traction for approximately four or five days. Then she had a CT scan uh, done in traction, which is really complicated and difficult to do. But we did it. We found out she was nicely reduced, and we put her into a halo vest. So she was in the halo vest for three months, a hard collar for two months, a soft collar for two months, 
and uh, she, her cervical spine alignment now is beautiful and she's completely straight. So it's much easier to maintain the C1, C2 alignment after subluxation in a patient who presents with an acute sublux as compared to someone who has been subluxed for a long time. So uh, in conclusion, C1, C2 subluxation is way more common in children for many different reasons because they're small, they have big heads, weak muscles, weak ligaments, soft bones, horizontal joints, lax ligaments. Um, imaging options include x-ray, CT scan, and MRI, and I hope you understand that although CT is the best option uh, because it causes a lot of radiation exposure, we try initially to get c cervical spine x-rays and open mouth views. Uh, if you see a child with torticollis it's, and subluxation, it's better to reduce the subluxation sooner rather than later. You can do a manual reduction, and, but unless you know how, what you're doing, I wouldn't recommend trying it in the office. It should always be done in the hospital. A chin strap traction or a halo traction can be used to get a good C1, C2 alignment. And once you have C1, C2 normal alignment, you need to immobilize the child. So you have hard collar options, but if a child is gonna take the collar off and not wear it, you may need to use a halo vest, which immobilizes the child with those poles that come in front of the halo vest. And then we use a halo vest for two to three months, depending on the cause and the uh, chronicity of the subluxation. You have to always remember in a cervical spine injury, you could have a vertebral artery injury, a nerve injury, or a spinal cord injury. So you have to watch these children for neurological symptoms. And in the end, a C1, C2, or occipital cervical fusion may be necessary. And uh, we, I have two summer students in my office and we just did a retrospective analysis of our patients that we've had here, uh, that we've treated at Morristown, and we have a total of 34 patients that we've managed, and of those, maybe only three to five have had to have cervical fusions. So if you see a child and there's a question, just think you have to immobilize them, you have to put them into a brace, and uh, definitely call your friendly neurosurgeon. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. So just in case, I would, you know, you could try to put them in a soft cervical collar with some oral Valium or oral Baclofen, but, you know, if you, if you want me just to see them as a baseline, just to make sure they get better and let you guys know when's the next step to order something, yeah, that's fine. There's a question, okay. An initial presentation, how would you distinguish this from sternocleidomastoid spasm? So, hello, Dr. Davis. So, the sternocleidomastoid spasm happens when the kid subluxes. So, you don't have to distinguish one from the other. They kind of go hand in hand. If you have a subluxation and the muscle is stuck in that position, it can get irritated. And if over time, the subluxation does not get reduced, then the muscle, because it's not stretching or working, eventually will shorten. So it's almost like in kids with uh, cerebral palsy, if they have chronic flexion of a joint, their muscles and ligaments shorten, and that's how contractures develop. So the sternocleidomastoid um, spasm is what we call it acutely, and then if it doesn't get reduced and they don't go back into normal, then you can actually have shortening or contracture of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. 
Oh, we didn't, that's a really good question. I'll have to look at that. Yeah, we didn't look at that. <laughs> we didn't, but all the kids that, the, the, past, the past three did not have any neurological problems. So I think, you know, part of it is because um, they are so mobile, the kids, that the vertebral artery, even though it gets twisted, it moves with the joint. And, you know, whereas an older person who could have, uh, calcification of the artery, it's not as mobile. You turn our heads the wrong way, like we're gonna have a stroke. But these kids, probably not. But I guess in an, you know, an acute a actual car accident or fracture, they definitely could have a vertebral artery injury. All right, I guess that's it. Thank you guys so much for watching. And John, Dr. Gregory, do you have anything to add? I know he's there. All right, thanks, guys.